coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. If we're not careful, we can begin to believe that it's not God's will to heal us. And if we do that, then that can cause us to doubt that we will receive what we ask for when we ask it. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery. You are watching Keys to Kingdom Living. Today we're bringing you a new word. It's entitled Beyond a Doubt. Whenever you're receiving a word and a standing on a promise from God, you've got to cast all doubt down. And it's imperative that we get a hold of the truth of God's word and get that truth in our heart so that it can cause the doubt to leave. When we have no doubt, we can receive God's promises because they're free. Matter of fact, the Bible says, in Christ, God's promises are yes and amen. Get out the word of God. Go with me, and let's hear beyond a doubt. James 1, beginning with verse 2. <clears throat> let's look at the scriptures and hear what the Spirit is saying today. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. How many would like to have a dose of patience? No hands went up. I don't understand that. <laughs> but let patience have its perfect work. Just as long as he hurries, I'll do it. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So wives, you need to pray for your husbands to have patience because he'll be perfect. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to work with me today, are you? <laughs> if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without uh, reproach. He will give to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him let him ask in faith no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for let not that man suppose that he will receive what anything from the Lord wow doubt kills your receptivity does it not from God without faith we cannot please him Without faith, we cannot receive from him. So James writes here, he says, For let not that man who doubts suppose that he will receive anything for the Lord from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Beyond a doubt, in a courtroom of law in America, when a person is being tried for a crime, they are presumed innocent until proven to be guilty. It is the duty of the defense attorney to present sufficient evidence that could cause jurors to doubt the prosecutor's case. If the prosecutor can't convince the members of the jury that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then whether the defendant is innocent or guilty, the jury must find them not guilty. God's word is truth. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind or repent. It does not matter what man may say or what man may believe about the validity or fidelity of God or his word. It is truth, and neither God nor his word shall pass away because they are true. They are absolutes. Amen? When it comes to us believing and receiving the promises written in God's Word, we must remember that God can't lie and His Word is truth. You've got to believe that beyond any doubt that God can't lie and God's Word is true. If you have any doubt about that, it's going to be hard to receive or overcome the enemy so you can receive that Word that is able to save your soul. What we must do as Christians is protect our hearts from the deceiver. He will try to trip us up so that we give place to doubt where we doubt God's word and it prevents us from receiving what God has for us, even as his children, God's children. If we doubt God or his word, then it means we are double-minded 
and won't receive anything from God according to James. Right? In America, it's more difficult to see miracles happen than it is over in third world countries. Think about that. The nation that has heard the gospel more times than any other nation in the world, gone to church more than probably all the nations put together in the world, yet it's harder to preach and, and see miracles happening in America than it is in third world countries. Why is that? Faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the word of God. So why is it so hard for Christians in America to receive miracles and so easy over in Africa and different places of the world for them to receive miracles, creative miracles, delivering miracles? There's a lot of things in America that we put our trust in other than God. And that trust in other things, you can't serve God and mammon, can you? You can't serve two masters. You've got to serve one or the other. And in America, it is easier for us to trust in ourselves and trust in our wealth and our own power than it is to trust in God. Therefore, when we absolutely need God, we struggle in America as believers to receive from God. Because there's a lot of, idea, uh, there's a lot of theology that is erroneous going about in the body of Christ that tells people that God does not heal today. And it's preached over pulpits in America that miracles ceased with the, uh, the death of the apostles in the early church. These doubts, these lies creep into people's hearing. And then you've got to overcome that. You remember when men slept, the enemy went and sowed tares among the wheat. Satan loves to, to spread his propaganda among Christians, lies, things that cast doubt against God's word so that we struggle to receive from God what we have need of. And it's God's pleasure to give us the kingdom of his, as his children. Right? I mean, even the Bible says a man that does not provide for his family is worse than an infidel. What kind of God would God be if he calls himself holy and loving to, to reject his children if we're needing the, the bare essentials of life and cannot get them from him? What's wrong with that? We need to get the truth back in American pulpits and let Christians hear the word of God so that we can stand on the word and start seeing the miracles of God so the world may know that God is alive and that he has the power to save, to deliver, and yes, to heal. As believers, we have to have enough faith in our hearts to overcome any shadow of doubt that may arise against the truth of God's word so that we can receive all that we need from God. But what if, we have to, uh, what if we have doubt, but don't recognize that doubt as doubt? Now we're going somewhere. What if we as Christians in America, I hate picking on Americans because uh, we, after all, picked on by a lot of people, but I'm an American. But what if Christians in America have doubt in the heart but don't recognize it as being doubt, therefore they don't challenge that doubt because they believe it's something other than doubt? Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the messianic prophecy that God gave Isaiah about Jesus coming to earth and all that Jesus would do in his ministry and in his work at the end of his time on earth on the cross to redeem us and to bring about healing and deliverance in our lives, not only salvation. So pick it up in verse 3, Isaiah 53. It says, And he, Jesus, is despised and rejected by men. He was rejected by Israel, wasn't he? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We despised, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. If he's carried them, then we don't have to. 
Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And say it with me. And by his stripes we are healed. That's pretty plain, isn't it? It says in Psalm 103 that he, he heals all our diseases. I believe it's uh, Psalm 34. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. We're told here in Isaiah that Jesus paid the price for our healing through the stripes that were put upon his back. He made it possible for us to be healed now that we're no longer under the curse of sin. Right? The curse of sin brought sickness and disease upon mankind. If Jesus, through the cross, has delivered us from the curse of sin, delivered us and redeemed us from the curse of the law, has redeemed us from being slaves of sin and made us sons and daughters unto God, that we should live unto him, then shouldn't it also uh, include that through that healing in the spirit that we are he healed physically? We are delivered physically? Huh? Absolutely. Jesus has paid the price for us to be healed. Now, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to God, who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body. See, he's talking about or referring to Isaiah 53, 7 there. We just read it. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. He didn't say you are healed. He says you were healed. Past tense, right? So Peter in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, is able to take what Isaiah prophesied before Jesus came to earth a step further than Isaiah was able to. Why was that? Because the work on the cross was already done. And through that work, we look back at that cross and say, I wasn't healed today. I was healed over 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, it is finished. He will not climb back, back up on that cross again. He will not shed another drop of blood. He will never have another demon stand in his face and smack him or spit upon him or draw one ounce of blood out of his body because the work was done 2,000 years ago. My healing was done my salvation was done everything i will ever need either in eternity or in this life was done two thousand years ago by whose stripes we were healed it was finished it's done all we have to do is receive it you know, it's amazing that it's so simple and easy for pe people, sinners, to receive Christ and to receive eternal life, which is by far the greatest miracle ever known to man, and so hard for us to receive something as simple as a miracle or healing. Why is that? Why is it so easy to receive salvation which far outweighs any physical healing or, or miracle I don't care how many times Lazarus got raised from the dead, eventually he's going to die and stay dead. But if he dies a sinner, he will never resurrect unto eternal life. But if he dies a Christian, he will be resurrected in newness of life and never know death again, right? Yet when we talk about healing and miracles, it's hard for people to get a hold and wrap their, uh, their mind around that. Why is it so hard? Because there's no preacher worth his war weight in salt that will ever cast doubt against the message of salvation. 
Have you ever heard a preacher preach against salvation? Have you ever heard a preacher preach against healing? Yes. That, that puts that doubt in us. It's ingrained in us. So we've got to get that doubt out of us because Peter says the work's already been done. You're not going to be healed. You were healed. It's done. We've seen so many miracles in this house. It's amazing that people struggle to believe God for their miracle and healing. So he takes a step further and says, by whose stripes you were healed. Peter declares that we were healed, past tense, by Jesus' stripes. Here's the problem. Not every Christian has been healed of everything that ails them. This is the problem. I don't just preach the, the fluff. I preach the reality. Here's the problem. There's a lot of Christians that have died sick. Not every Christian has been healed of everything that ails them. So what's up? Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is what? Long-suffering toward who? Us. We're slow, so he's long-suffering. It takes us a while to come around sometimes, right? But God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that how many? How many? How many? All. All should what? Come to repentance. It's not God's will that any should perish and go to hell. God did not create hell for people. He created it for Satan and his fallen uh, angels, the demons, right? That's why when man fell, it is recorded in the Bible that it says hell has enlarged its mouth. It is God's will that all should repent of their sins, believe the gospel, and be saved. That's scripture, correct? All. No one left out. Will this happen? No. It will not happen. Why? Not because of God. Because God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, right? So why won't this happen? Because of man's doubt and unbelief. That's it. You remove doubt and unbelief out of a person's heart, they're going to believe. They're going to believe the truth, right? Here's another problem that has to be addressed. Are we, who haven't received the healing or miracles we've prayed about and asked God for, recognizing doubt as doubt so we can overcome the doubt, and receive what has already been given to us through Jesus freely. Like Patricia was singing, you can't buy it, but you can get it for free. It's priceless, but it's a gift. So many times we, we pray and we ask God for a miracle, for a healing, and for whatever reason, it does not come. Are we recognizing this doubt as doubt so that we can overcome the doubt so that we can then receive what has already been given to us that is free? If it's free, we don't have to work for it. Healing is free. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to do incantations. We don't have to cast spells. We don't have to climb up on Mount Everest and find God. It's free, right? So all you got to do is what? Receive it. Turn with me to Mark 11. It's all right in here in Scripture. Mark 11, verse 19. When evening had come, Jesus went out of the city. 
Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up. Jesus had already cursed this fig tree because there was no fruit in it when he passed by it. So he cursed it, and it dried up. So they come back by in the morning afterwards, and they see that the fig tree is dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. That's all he tells us to do, right? Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, but here it comes, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will what? It does not say, and you might, you perhaps, you could, it may be possible. It says you will have them, right? Don't get under condemnation. I can feel that spirit right now. People are getting under condemnation. This word is not about bringing condemnation on you. It's about setting you free from the lies of the devil. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God said, I've sent my son that you may have a life and have it more abundantly. How are you going to get that life? You get it through knowing the truth, and the truth will make you free from the lies of the enemy. So how many has been asking God for a need to be met, and you have prayed about this need on many occasions, but you still haven't gotten the answer? Perhaps all of us. If we're not careful, we can begin to believe that it's not God's will to heal us. And if we do that, then that can cause us to doubt that we will receive what we ask for when we ask it. Because I have not gotten it yet. Because I have asked repeatedly. That can cause me to start doubting that it's God's will for me to have it. Because I have not yet gotten it. Right? How can we as Christians, children of God, receive healing or a miracle from God if we have a shadow of doubt in our heart that it might not be God's will to heal us? Think about that. You're asking God to heal you. You need a miracle from God, but yet you've been praying for this and it has not happened. Therefore, you've got doubt in your heart that it's God's will that he heal you. But on the other hand, you're saying, God, heal me. So you're struggling with that doubt, yet there's a part of you that believes that he still wants to heal you. That's the war in the church in America. We believe that he will heal us, or he can heal us, but will he heal us? That has been a problem for decades in America. That's why I started out talking about somebody being on trial and how that the, it's the burden of the uh, prosecutor to prove the case. It's only the burden of the uh, defense attorney to cast just enough doubt in the jurors hearts to cause them to say not guilty on the other hand as Christians we've got to get all that doubt out of our hearts so that we can receive what did Jesus say there in Mark 11 have faith in God that's it have faith in God if you can have faith in God and you pray and ask it will be yours according to what Jesus said I'm not preaching something out of my own uh, belief. I'm preaching what he just said in his word. Right? Verse 24. Therefore I say, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Right? So why do we trip up over that scripture? Recently, I don't know how far back, but recently I was just going through my day and the Holy Spirit revealed what I'm presenting to you today. He said, what if 
doubt posed itself as being God's will that a person not be healed. Get this in your spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit. He says, what if doubt posed itself as being God's, that it's God's will that a person not be healed? That would be easy to believe because I've asked and it did not happen. But because it did not happen does not mean it's not God's will. Did you hear what I'm saying? Just because it did not happen does not mean it was not God's will. It means there's something that is standing in the way and the enemy is trying to delay your answer so you will start doubting, so you will not get it. See, when the word comes and it gets in your heart, you'll get on that word until you receive it. But if the enemy can come and take that word out of your heart, you will abort your promise. Daniel prayed how long? 21 days. When did God hear him? When? When he opened up his mouth and prayed the prayer of faith, God heard him instantly. How long did it take for that prayer to manifest? 21 days. Before you know it, it seems like we run out of time, but before I leave you, I want to encourage you, stay tuned next week for the powerful conclusion of Beyond a Doubt. God has given us powerful revelation to help you so that you can build up your faith through the Word of God and receive the, the healing or the miracle you may be needing. God has moved through this message and touched people's lives. We had a testimony of a lady that her eyes, I don't know if they were swelling shut, but she, she couldn't open her eyes. And during the uh, broadcast of this message on our live stream, she said the Lord opened up her eyes and she could see so clearly. And what an amazing God we have that when you hear the word, his power comes upon you and sets you free. I pray that's true for you today. If you have any health problems, I pray that God's Spirit is touching you right now and takes that away from you. Matter of fact, if you have a testimony of a healing or a miracle because of the word that you've heard today, I encourage you to email us and let us know. You can do that at prayer at whcnorth.org. The information will be on the screen. Also, if you would like to stand with this ministry, we need financial supporters to help us get this message out to more and more stations. God has given us opportunities literally to go around the world, and we're grateful to have that opportunity. But we need people who will stand with us and help hold our arms up. Will you prayerfully consider doing that? It would be an honor and a pleasure to have you a partner with us so that we can get the message of the gospel out to the nations of the world. And as I get ready to leave you, I want to encourage you, send in your prayer requests and your praise reports. Let us know how this ministry is being used by the Lord to touch your life so that we can celebrate with you and pray and stand in agreement for you. That's why we're here, to help each other stand up for the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. So until this time next week, keep your eyes on Jesus and looking up. God richly bless you is my prayer. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 